our opening song this morning is played by Steve Bell, number uh, 302, Children of the Human Race. At the beginning of a Westwood service, whether in person or online, we pause to affirm that the land where we gather has borne witness to thousands of years of Indigenous history, culture, and spirituality. Westwood's building resides in Amuskachi, Waskahagan, the Cree name for Edmonton, meaning Beaver Hills, and is located on Treaty 6 territory. It is the traditional home of diverse Indigenous peoples, including Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakoto Sioux, and many others. I invite you to type into the chat where you are from if it is not Treaty 6. Before my ancestors arrived, there were people here, and they ex still exist to this day. Diverse nations of people who build complex societies, civilizations, and cultures, and have over a span of many, many generations. As treaty, as treaty people, we are partners in the stewardship of the land we all rely on, responsible for the impacts of our choices, responsible to the ancestors who came before us and responsible to future generations. In the spirit of reconciliation and decolonization, I light this candle as an expression of our solidarity with indigenous communities in their fight for self-determination. Welcome to Westwood Unitarian, a Unitarian Universalist community where our search for spirituality and our passion for social justice meet and mingle. Unitarian Universalism is defined as a liberal religion characterized by a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. At Westwood Unitarian, music is an expression of our joy worship a sign of our faith, and acts of justice a symbol of our hope. My name is Heather McLean Smith, and my pronouns are she and her. It is my honor to be your service leader this morning. 
Our guest speaker today is one of our newer members, Maddie Webb. Thank you, Alara, Stefan Gadet, and Bill Lee for both of your tech supports this morning, as well as Steve Bell and Rebecca Patterson for their beautiful mu musical contributions. And on behalf of the congregation, I bid a special welcome to new visitors, especially while we're on Zoom. I invite you to stay for coffee hour chat after the service. We'll break out into breakout rooms and you're welcome to join a small group or stay in the center space and chat with Maddie and myself and anyone else that wants to talk as a group. And if you have any questions about Westwood or UUism in general, you're welcome to email worship at westwoodunitarian.ca. Now our chalice lighting. So I'm going to read the words and then I'm going to light my chalice. So if you have a chalice or a candle nearby, now is the time to bring it forward. Lighting candles together is one of the ways that we share in a ritual or a practice even when we are in separate locations. Our chalice list our chalice lighting this morning is by Anne Sexton from her excerpt of Little Girl. How can I say that I've known just what you know and just where you are? What I want to say is let your body in, let it tie you in, in comfort. What I want to say is that there is nothing in your body that lies. All that is new is telling the truth. I'm here that somebody else, an old tree in the background, you stand still at the door, sure of yourself, a white stone, a good stone, an exceptional, as laughter, you will strike fire, that new thing. It's a thick wick, it doesn't want to light. We'll try again. Community is deepened by our sharing with each other and what is in our hearts. At this time in our service, we pause to reflect on our week. We recall our milestones, the joys, the concerns, and the sorrows, the changes in our lives, those who need our healing thoughts. I invite you to share any joys and concerns into the chat while we enjoy all be played and composed by Steve Bell.
I would like to light one final candle for all of the joys and sorrows that remain in our hearts but left unspoken. <clears throat> Please join us in our affirmation on the screen. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. I loved that affirmation so much, I got it tattooed on my body. Westwood is a self-sustained community maintained and sustained by its membership. There are many ways to donate to Westwood, including by sharing your volunteer time, sharing your talent and donating financially. E-transfers can be made out to info at westwoodunitarian.ca. Thank you for your generosity and your continued support. Now let's sing along to Rebecca Patterson. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. Maddie Webb is one of Westwood's members. He zooms in each week from Cold Lake, Alberta, and has been in the Air Force for the last eight years. Maddie grew up in Southern Ontario and began his gender transition in 2008. He has been married for 15 and a half years to his partner, Michelle. Together, they have two cats, often featured in the Zoom room. Maddie loves musicals and coloring. He likes to ride his bike and fancies himself to be a history buff and loves to learn. Please welcome Maddie. Hello everyone and thank you so much for your presence today and every day. A special thank you to those of whom uh, today is just as hard as yesterday and just as hard as tomorrow is likely to be. Before I begin, I would like to provide a disclaimer. The topic I'm about to discuss and the manner in which I will explore it may make some people uncomfortable. If you have a history of trauma, in particular homophobic, transphobic, or biphobic trauma, please know I am here with you, I see you, and I love you. If you have a history of homophobia, transphobia, or biphobia, whether intentional or unintentional, Please accept this opportunity to learn, to listen, and to be a little uncomfortable. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. These are lyrics from the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, South Pacific, published in 1949. Let's take a moment to consider these words. Consider them as we take a collective breath and sit in the discomfort of them. Consider the fact that they were written over 70 years ago. Consider them from our places of privilege and hold on to them for the remainder of our journey together today. When I hear this song, the first place my thoughts go to is the basic premise of this moment in the musical, which is that racism is not born into a person. As Joseph Cable, a United States Marine Corps officer says, right before he sings the song, it happens after you're born. But when I look deeper into the lyrics, there's another theme that I can personally identify with as well. 
fear, homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, anything different from me and mine phobia. And of course, there's that other word, hate. Let's not sugarcoat anything here. When we talk about fears that are taught, they are highly associated with hatred. Another thing that is incredibly poignant in regards to fears that are taught and that these particular lyrics address is the link to the young. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight. As I was preparing to speak on this topic, I recall the numerous times I've been asked in the past, why are we talking about this? Why bother talking about all these phobias at all? Don't we already have all the laws and ability to live our truth and have ownership of our bodies? Hasn't the free world already moved to a place of good through democratic processes to ensure equal rights? To that, I have one word to say. Well, I have a lot more than one word, but I'll start with just one. Florida. Let's take a trip together to this Southern state. June 12th, 2016, Orlando. Over 300 people are attending a popular Latin night event at an LGBTQ2 plus hotspot, Pulse nightclub. Just after 2 a.m., shots begin to ring out. Many people in attendance at first believe the sounds are part of the music until the sights begin to show the truth. People scramble and rush to find somewhere, anywhere to hide. They make frantic calls from bathroom stalls to emergency services. Some hold the hands of friends or family members watching and waiting for help that will come too late. Three hours later, terrified patrons who have somehow managed to survive are finally freed from the building. During those terrifying hours, 49 lives were ended. But do these lives account for all of the damage done? Over 50 other patrons were injured. More than 300 people were there that night, each one left with lingering questions. Those 300 people had friends. They had families, they had neighbors. They had countless people around the world who woke up to the news and took those images in and just may have felt two things at the same time. That could have been me. And thank goodness it wasn't me. But that was eight years ago. Surely things are better now, especially in a nation that is so proud of its democratic processes. March 28th. 2022, Orlando, Florida. Pulse Orlando, now a memorial that no longer plays host to the revels of the past, posts a birthday notice for Jean Carlos Nieves Rodriguez, one of the 49 who lost their lives. He was 27 and had just become a homeowner when he was killed. In Spring Hill, Florida, a few hours after the birthday message, Interesting that it was a few hours. Florida Governor Rick DeSantis signs into law a bill to prohibit classroom discussion about sexual orientation or gender identity in certain grade levels or in a specified manner. Florida Statute 1001.42, Powers and Duties of District School Boards, Subsection 8, Student welfare, paragraph C3, quote, classroom instruction by personnel or third parties on sexual orient orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten through grade three or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards, end quote. Kindergarten to grade three before you are six or seven or eight. This leaves education on these subjects for Florida's children in the hands of relatives, relatives who may not know any better. As in the lyrics, you've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight. 
to hate all the people your relatives hate. Rogers and Hammerstein identified in 1949 the exact thing that Florida is capitalizing on. The best time to teach someone before it's too late is when they are young. What Florida is doing by prohibiting the instruction of certain topics that are relevant in society is actually creating the potential of promoting fear. And with fear comes hatred. Even those with the best intentions may not be able to protect their own relatives from the fear and hatred of others. We can actually look back north of the border for proof of this. Annick Denel from Gatineau, Quebec has been speaking out since losing her 10 year old child earlier this year to suicide. Her child born Anne Sophie had one year earlier expressed the desire to be called Alex and to present in a more gender neutral manner. Alex had very supportive parents, a decently accepting school principal and teachers, but was bullied and intimidated by other children for being what these children felt was not normal. Something they were never taught was just a natural part of human expression. When children are not given instruction in educational institutions, where do they learn things from? I suppose that really depends on the environment in which they are raised. And numerous theories exist and have been debated ad nauseum. It's not my intention to debate these theories here. However, we can look to some powerful LGBTQ2 plus voices for some insight into two highly influential knowledge paths, media and family. There is an incredible documentary on Netflix called Disclosure that raises up many prominent trans voices and touches on the topic about learning from what we see in the media. And what we've seen on television in both daytime talk shows and primetime shows, in movies and on the news is a very narrow-minded portrayal of trans lives. Trans women as sex workers, victims of crime or perpetrators of crime. Trans men as vicious toxic roid ragers or dying from hormone use. Do I look like a toxic roid rager to you? I'm really not. At one point, Laverne Cox says, quote, seeing trans people loved, uplifted, and well-regarded in film and television can endear you to step in when you see a trans person being harassed on the street and to make sure the trans people in your life are supported in ways that affirm their humanity. But when all you see reinforced is violence, we're put further in harm's way, end quote. The types of visuals provided by the media allow those who are not taught any differently to continue the cycle of violence being inflicted on those from the LGBTQ2 plus communities because it is seen as being a common and sadly acceptable reaction. Another influential knowledge path comes from family. In yet another fantastic Netflix special, and I should probably note at this point in time, this is not sponsored by Netflix. Nanette comedian Hannah Gadsby sums up very succinctly how those around you can not only influence your perception of others, but your perception of yourself. Hannah talks about growing up in the Bible Belt in Tasmania during a time where the criminality of being a homosexual was being debated. Hannah says, quote, 70% of the people I lived amongst believed that homosexuality should be a criminal act. 70% of the people who raised me, who loved me, who I trusted, believed that homosexuality was a sin, that homosexuals were heinous, subhuman pedophiles. 70%. By the time I ident identified as being gay, it was too late. I was already homophobic. And you do not just get to flick a switch on that. No. What you do is you internalize that homophobia and you learn to hate yourself. Hate yourself to the core. I sat soaking in shame in the closet for 10 years 
because the closet can only stop you from being seen. It is not shame proof. When you soak a child in shame, they cannot develop the neurological pathways that carry thoughts of self-worth. They can't do that. Self-hatred is only ever a seed planted from outside in. But when you do that to a child, it becomes a weed so thick and it grows so fast, the child doesn't know any different. It becomes as natural as gravity, end quote. Powerful words, powerful and true. Let's return to the song. In the second half of the song, Carefully Taught, Emile de Beck, a French plantation owner who is upset about the loss of a woman he loved when she found out he had two mixed race children, responds to the words that Cable sang in a way I feel a great connection to, as I'm sure many of my fellow rainbow folk do as well. This is just the kind of ugliness I was running away from. It has followed me all this way, all these years, and now it has found me. I was cheated before and I'm cheated again by a mean little world full of mean little men. And the one chance for me is this life I know best to be here on an island and to hell with the rest. I'll cling to this island like a tree or a stone. I'll cling to this island and be free and alone. The reason this resonates with me is because when you are trying to fight for what is right and you are the one on the side of the unacceptable minority, the most natural and comfortable thing to do is run away and hide, to find an island and cling to it, to be free and alone. So how do we change this cycle? How do we lift up the voices of those who have been continually shoved down to break down the fear and stop the hatred? We speak up. We raise awareness, we raise flags, some of us make watches. Last year, I was given the exciting and quite humbling opportunity to raise the inclusive pride flag at Four Wing Cold Lake for Canada Service Pride Week at the end of August. Something really amazing that happened is actually what you can see in the image on the slide. The progressive pride flag was painted at this particular crosswalk in the purposefully chosen direction by yours truly to point from the medical center, which is a place of healing, towards the Catholic church, which you see in the background. To point from a place of healing towards the Catholic church. Another amazing thing that happened that week was the numerous other flags that were raised on flagpoles in front of many other buildings around the wing. One particular flag that made me very happy was the one outside of the main gate in front of the military police building. That flag happened to be my own personal flag that was given to me earlier in the year after it had been raised on 17 May, which is the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia. 17 May is a commemorative event that has been held around the world annually since 2004. This day is meant as a day to speak up and speak out against these fears that lead to so much hatred around the world. This year's international theme is our bodies, our lives, our rights. Our bodies. What we can do to promote and affirm our physical beings in order to settle our minds and be able to look in a mirror and see ourselves our lives, the ability to live them without fear or hatred, whether internal or external, to live our truth, to learn from lives lived before ours. Our rights, the freedom to know that a democratic process can and must rely on and invite minority voices to the table and give them a proportional amount of weight so that the majority cannot dictate their own biases. Fondation Emergence is a Quebec LGBTQ2 plus equity organization. This year it has launched a wonderful campaign for their contribution to the 17 May activities. 
they have created a watch with only 54 seconds instead of 60. One second was removed for each of the six colors of the rainbow pride flag. Each color was given one of six primary ways that members of the LGBTQ2 plus communities experience violence. The website is 54secondswatch.com. There is a video available on this website that I considered sharing with you all this morning. However, it is extremely difficult to watch. Um, I personally have watched it far too many times. Uh, the campaign is fantastic, however, and the site does highlight uh, some really incredible numbers. There's also a great deal of free resources available to order or for download. As I watched the virtual launch of this campaign earlier this week, I was encouraged by the passionate voices of the campaign leaders. Something that really struck me as being so freeing was that every person who spoke at the event introduced themselves by name, personal pronouns, and sexual orientation. To be in a room, virtual or not, with a group of people who are willing to be so open and honest was truly a beautiful thing. As one person stands up and says, this is me, it gives permission to others to stand up as well. When we can see ourselves in the eyes of others, we suddenly become less alone and more connected. Less alone and more connected. My hope for Florida and for global society as a whole is for truth and honesty to be taught, for acceptance of humans as humans, for humanity to be able to change the lyrics from teaching fear and hatred to teaching love and acceptance, to make sure that no one is cheated by a mean little world full of mean little men, to make this entire planet an island where everyone can be free and no one feels alone. I'd like to leave you with this one final parting gift. Should you ever find yourself with the ability to make a drastic change, to lift up a voice that is telling you it isn't being heard and to do so in a manner that upholds the democratic process, for example, to make it clear that oppression of any kind needs to be actively dismantled. Listen to the voices that are asking you to do the work and give them the weight that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Maddie. Now let's bring our candles and our chalices forward. And I will share with you our closing words for hard times, written by Maureen Kaloran. No matter how weak or how frightened you may feel, we each have gifts that can make a difference in the world. In this coming week, may you do at least one thing to support the broken, to welcome the stranger, to celebrate what is worthy, to do the work of justice and love. Be strong, be connected. Each day, act so you may be a little more whole. Thank you. Amen. Our last hymn this morning is our hearts our heart is in a holy place number 1008 played by steve bell please sing along
Thank you everyone for joining this morning. Please, you're invited to stick around for coffee hour chat. We'll be assembled in the breakout rooms or you can stay in the center place. And I look forward to seeing you next week, May 8th, Board Visions and Local Dreams with Reverend Ann Barker and Board. Thank you everyone and I'll see you next time.